So I'm going to talk today about some problems that arise in Proclus's discussion of providence and human agency. Um, so Proclus believes in providence, that there's a kind of divine causality that orders all things for the good. But he says that a certain kind of universal prior necessitation would be incompatibility with our having the kind of control that we take ourselves to have over our actions. So the question then is how can we allow for divine providence while making sense of intentional human action? Um, and what does Proclus's account of that tell us about the kind of necessitation that he takes to be compatible with human agency and the kind that he takes not to be compatible with human agency? What I'm going to do is I'm first of all going to present what I think are two, what look as if they're two very different answers to that question, both of them to be found in Proclus. Um, that seems to raise a puzzle. Why does he give these two different answers? And I'll suggest a way that one can explain how these two seemingly different answers are compatible with each other. But then I'll raise some puzzles for the resulting view that I attribute to Proclus um, and end by suggesting a way that possibly Proclus could answer those puzzles. And what I'd really like to hear what you have to think of to, to say about is um, how attractive an account of agency can that be made to be if, if we go that way. So the two different accounts, um, the first is what he says when he's discussing the myth of Ur in Plato's Republic, and the second is found in his shorter works on providence and 10 problems on providence that people here have done so much to um, bring to our, our attention. Um, so let me first of all um, say something about what he says in his account of the myth of Ur. So here Proclus raises what looks like a puzzle for um, Plato's account. So the puzzle is how can we make sense of the kind of providential order in the universe as a whole while still allowing souls to choose their future lives as they're said to do in the myth of Ur. Um, we need to really give weight to Plato's view that the soul chooses its future life if we're to make sense of the soul's responsibility for the things it does during that life, Proclus says. But that looks as if it threatens the idea that the universe is a kind of ordered whole. So turning to my handout, so I, first of all, he, he, he emphasizes the need for an overall controlling power, and in particular, the need for the cosmos of, as a whole to be in some sense in control of us. The cosmos is a unified living being, beings like us, live our lives within the cosmos, um, and we must be in conformity with the overall cosmic order. That can't be achieved, Proclus thinks, by the universe somehow conforming itself to us because the universe is a more elevated, better kind of thing than we are. Um, as he says, I put on the handout, the whole does not follow the parts, but rather it's fitting for the part to follow the whole. So the cosmos must have some kind of overall control over things within it, including us. Otherwise, he says, and this is on the handout, it will not be possible to save the account of providence. It pertains to providence to guard everywhere the worth of each thing, both of the wholes and of the parts, and to order all things in relation to each other and to refer them to the one good. But if it is conceded that the revolution of the all is consequent on us, the order of the whole would disappear with many chance things happening on account of our impulses. But then the good that is from providence would no longer have power over all things, for it is not good that the better should follow the lead of things that are worse, the things that are worse here being us. 
So that seems to give a picture of we need this overall providential control. But on the other hand, um, Proclus emphasizes that it's important that we should genuinely make choices when we choose our further our, our future lives. That can't just all be, um, we can't just be being used, as he says, like tools by the cosmos. Um, so one thing he says is that the soul must have a genuine choice between alternatives when it makes, when it opts for its future life, because otherwise what it does doesn't really count as a choice at all. So he says, if you just, if the cosmos just sort of presented one type of life to each soul, there will again not be what depends on us in the choices, for there is no choice between one thing, but only between at least two. For every preferential choice, prohiresis, involves preferring one thing to another. If we didn't have genuine choices, so with these two alternatives, more than one alternative, then nothing would depend on our choices. Um, something else, namely the cosmos, would be in control of the things we do, not we who do those things. In that case, Proclus says, the responsibility for acting rightly or wrongly would no longer be assigned to us, but rather to the thing that is in control. So Proclus shows himself very clearly aware of this worry that if something else is just sort of making us choose what we choose, then um, how could we be responsible for what we do? Um, and I think one is very striking in the commentary on the myth of a, how, how clearly he makes that, he brings out that worry that sort of the two, the two things he's trying to reconcile here, the need for um, the cosmos to in some sense be in overall control of us and um, the need for us to have the kind of control over our actions that makes us responsible for them. Um, now, Proclus has an ingenious solution, I think. Um, and the solution depends upon saying that the lottery that we're told about in the myth of the, the lottery, remember, is what determines where, which soul gets to choose their lives first. And so it determines what range of lives you've got to choose between, right? So if you um, come first in the lottery, then you choose between all the different lives. If you come later, then there aren't so many lives left to choose between, this is in Plato. So Proclus says the lottery is really fixed, right? So it's, it's, it's a kind of fake lottery. It's not just chance what um, place you get in the lottery. Um, each soul receives a lot. So each soul has a certain range of lives to choose between, but which lot you get, and so which range of lives you get to choose between is determined by your worth. And your worth is determined, he says, not only by the choices that you have made in the past, but also by what you will choose in the future. So there's some, there's the facts about your character that, um, uh, that are what you would choose in the future and what you have chosen in the past, that is the worth of your soul. And that, that fact about your, let's say your character, your worth, is what determines what range of lives you get to choose between. Now, I think that, Pro he's not completely clear about this, but I think the idea is meant to be this, that suppose the universe, the overall cosmic plan, um, depends on you choosing life G. Um, the prophet who's presenting all these um, choices to you foresees that given your character, if you're presented with a choice between A, B and G, then you will choose G. That's just foreseeing something on the basis of your character. Whereas, of course, if presented with some other choice, say G, F, and R, you might choose something else like R. So if the prophet wants to ensure that you choose G, all that's needed is for the lottery to be fixed so that the choice of lives you're presented with is the choice A, B, and G, the choice from which we know, you, given your character, you will prefer G. So that's a very ingenious way, I think, of allowing the cosmic agent to retain a kind of overall control um, 
while allowing you to have a genuine choice. So the thought is you do have, you are given alternatives. And also on this picture, the cosmic forces are not actually causing you to choose G out of A, B and G in the sense that it's up to you which of those you choose, right? Um, um, they're just foreseeing that given your character, you will choose G if given that choice. And notice that way of reconciling providential control with human responsible agency seems to depend upon the idea that the divine agent foresees something, namely that given these circumstances, you will choose G, but doesn't actually cause, I mean, only indirectly causes that you will choose G by setting up circumstances such that you will predictably choose G. So the, the divine cosmic age, the divine agent doesn't choose that, doesn't make you choose G out of A, B, and G. So that's the first of the two stories about providence and agential control that I wanted to present to you. Now, as I said, I think there are two stories and the other story sounds very different. Um, so the other story is, I think, uh, more familiar to people. I mean, so it, it's more what you would get if you asked what Proclus's official account of this matter was. Because um, Proclus's official account of providence is that providence is a power that's on a very elevated level. It's beyond the intellectual realm. Um, so it's it's a be, it's not it's something that operates from as it were outside time. Um, and um, when Proclus tries to explain elsewhere how um, providential control can be um, consistent with the kind of control we have over our actions, um, he draws on this idea that providence is a kind of um, power that operates from outside the temporal realm. Um, and that's a rather different picture from the picture that we've just had when thinking about the myth of Earth. Now, when Proclus is thinking about providence in these kinds of contexts, he raises a general question about pro how providence can have knowledge of changing individuals down here, um, given that providence is a kind of divine power that from outside the changing temporal realm. Um, one solution would be to deny that providence has such knowledge and to say that instead the divine beings just have knowledge of eternal forms and individuals participate in those eternal forms. But in his commentary on the Parmenides, um, Proclus is very explicit that he doesn't want to solve the problem that way. So this is where he's talking about the difficulty raised in Plato's Parmenides of whether God could have knowledge of things that belong to this world. So it's very much the problem that um, Proclus is concerned with in relation to providence. And he says here um, that it's necessary that God and the gods know all things, both the general and the particular, and the eternal and the at the same time, and that they rule all things, not the general classes only, but also the particular, since one providence from them permeates all things. So he's, he still has this problem how to reconcile this kind of divine knowledge and control with the atemporal character of the divine. And he puts forward a solution that became very important in later medieval philosophy. Um, and this was to argue that the character of knowledge depends on the knowing subject, not on its object. So in particular, it's possible to have a kind of changeless knowledge of an object that is changing. We don't need to say that divine beings change in order to ascribe to them knowledge of changing things. And similarly, Proclus says, the divine being can know contingent things 
even though the divine being and its knowing, its knowledge, is necessary. Um, he says this in a number of places, and I've put one of them on the handout from the Elements of Theology. Um, so even though the object of its knowledge is a thing of parts, nevertheless, the divine knowledge of parted things will be partless. And though its object is mutable, it itself, the knowledge is immutable. Though its object is contingent, it itself is necessary, um, and so on because the divine does not get knowledge extraneously from its inferiors in such a way that the knowledge would have to have the nature of the object known. Now, it's quite hard to work out exactly what all that amounts to, but I take it that at least in the case of changing things, the thought is meant to be something like this, that there's one fact that can be known in a um, sort of temporal way or in an atemporal way. So an example of that, and I'm not saying that this is exactly what Proclus had in mind, but an example of how that might work would be um, one can know it's sunny today. Right? That's a kind of temporal knowledge. But one could also know it's sunny on such and such a date whatever today's date is, the 11th of April, right? Um, um, and the first kind of knowledge, it's sunny today, if you're going to hang on to knowledge of that fact, it's not going it, to, it, it would be a different fact if you thought it's sunny today and you thought that tomorrow, right? Whereas if you think it's sunny on 8th of April, 2022, then it, that fact doesn't change. So you can, so there's a way in which you could grasp that same fact in a way that would imply your grasp of it would have to change if it was it's sunny today and there's a way in which you might grasp that same fact in a way that wouldn't imply your sort of um grasp of it would have to change with the change of the facts if you thought of it as that dated fact so supposing that Proclus has something like that idea in mind with the thought that you can grasp these changing facts but in a sort of tenseless timeless way that doesn't really quite yet explain how divine beings could have knowledge of changing things. I think what that shows is how a divine being could have a thought about, a belief about a changing thing. But you might think that for knowledge, you need somehow some connection with the thing known. And so you might think there's still a problem. Um, you know, when I know that it's sunny today, there's something about the sunniness today that's connected to my having the knowledge, right? It's because I'm, I can see the sun, right? And so there's some sense in which the fact that things outside are acting on me is relevant to my knowing that it's sunny today. And Proclus has to deny that divine knowledge works quite like that. So you might wonder, well, how can a divine being have the right kind of connection to these changing facts, to have something that counts as knowledge of them, not just a belief? And I think Proclus's answer to that is to say that providence and the divine providential beings um, know these changing things by causing them. So there is a causal relation, it's just that the causal relation isn't that those, ex those changing things act on the divine being, but rather that the divine being has a kind of maker's knowledge of these changing things, is able, because it's the source of those things, that gives it the right kind of connection with the changing things to have a kind of knowledge of them. Um, and I've put a passage where he says this on the handout. So it starts out um, in the way that's just familiar to the thing that I quoted from the elements of theology. So the gods themselves, however, unlike us, know that which has come to be uncreatedly that which is extended unextendedly and so on, that which is temporal eternally, that which is possible necessarily. But then he says, so this is the new bit, for in the very act of knowing they generate all things and what they generate, they generate from the undivided and eternal and immaterial forms. As a result, they know these things in this way. So I think that it's an essential part of the explanation of how these divine beings can have knowledge of changing things, that the knowledge is a kind of knowledge that's bound up with being the cause of those things. So a consequence of that is that the things 
for contingent things, including things that are up to us, the sorts of things where we take ourselves to be exercising agential control, are not only known by providence, but also caused by providence. Um, and Proclus says as much at the end of his treatise on providence. So he says, the gods know what depends on us, that is, know it in a divine and timeless manner, and yet we act according to our nature, and whatever we choose is foreknown by them, but not because of a determination in us, but because of one in them. So I take it that, the, again, he's saying the knowledge that they have of these contingent things comes from the fact or is, is a knowledge they have by causing those things. Okay, so that's a very different account from the account that I mentioned from the myth of Ur. Because if you remember the whole story, the whole elaborate thing about the lottery being a setup in the myth of Ur, seem to depend upon the thought that it's really important that um, you know, the prophet or whatever the cosmic agent is doesn't cause my choice, right? It just sets things up and foresees that if it sets things up in that way, I will choose. And that seems to be quite important to my being responsible for um, what the results of my choice. Whereas here we seem to have an account whereby the kind of knowledge that prof provid providential agents have of the changing world depends upon those providential agents, not just foreseeing what will happen in the changing world, but in some sense being the cause of what happens in the changing world. Um, so the, the, the whole idea that, that it's really important that it foresees without causing, which was seemed quite an interesting idea in the um, commentary on the myth of Ur, can't really work with this, this kind of account. So two questions then for that combination of views. So one question is how to reconcile those two solutions, um, um, given that the first seems to depend upon the idea that the divine power foresees our choices without causing them, whereas the second insists that providence knows our choices by causing them. And then the second question is, is just how can the second, how can this second account work? So how can something still be contingent if it's not merely known by providence, but also in some sense caused by providence? I'm, I'm going to suggest that the answer to those two questions is, is related. So the answer to the first question, I think, is that these are two accounts of different kinds of divine agency. Um, so the prophet in the myth of Ur is a kind of intermediate, intermediary of the divine agents. This isn't, the prophet isn't, in, it doesn't itself count as, um, as it were, a providential agent because the prophet is, is acting within time and we've been told providence is at the level above time. Um, and if you notice in the bits that I quoted from the commentary on the myth of Ur, the point about providence there is that it's need, what would undermine providence would be if the cosmos didn't have control over us. So really the kind of level of control that's being talked about in the myth of Ur is we need, it needs to be true that the cosmos as a whole exercises some control over us. And that needs to be true because providence makes, it's in accord with providence that the better should have control over the worse. But the cosmos exercising control over us via the prophet in the myth of Ur, that's a kind of divine, divine-ish intervention that happens within time. Right? So that's a kind of temporal intervention into the world. Um, whereas in the account, the second account, the account of providence as the cause of what it understands, we're talking about providence proper, that is something that exercises a kind of agency from outside time, not something that intervenes in the world in the temporal course of events. So my thought is that it might be important that something acting within time in the way that the prophet does in presenting the choice of lives to the souls is um, not causing those choices, whereas it might on prophet's view be okay if something that's acting atemporally um, is um, causing the choices. Um, 
to flesh out that idea, um, I want now to turn to the second of those two questions I raised. So how can something still be contingent if it's not merely known, but caused by this above time atemporal providence? So I think Proclus's answer to that is just to lay out an account of contingency that works with that. And it's quite an interesting account of contingency. It's an account of contingency where something counts as contingent at a time. And I put this on the handout. So whether a certain event E will happen at T star is contingent at the earlier time T. If and only if at T, the causes then operative in time do not yet fix whether E will happen at T star. But that's compatible with something else, divine providence, eternally determining that E will happen at T star. Now, Proclus says something that goes beyond that a bit. I think Proclus's view is that everything that's present and past is not contingent on this account, right? Because now um, all the court temporal causes have already fixed that everything present and past is um, going to happen. Um, of things in the future, um, some of them will be contingent. So the causes cu currently operative in the temporal world do not fix everything about the future. Um, but interestingly, Proclus seems to suggest that as you get closer to these future events, some of them become necessary. And indeed, he seems to say all of them become necessary just before they happen. So let me read out the passage. So he says, everything that is somehow indeterminate has its indeterminacy and so-called contingency in the fact that it does not yet exist but it ends into that which by necessity either exists or does not exist. And this either a strong, long or a short time before its occurrence. And this is what the conjectural divinations show for they are true more when made a shorter time than a longer time before the future events, as if the indeterminate had already fallen into necessity. So, the point is that um, certain things about the future are not yet fixed. They can be interfered with. So probably whether I will manage to get on a plane back to the UK tomorrow is not yet fixed. There are all sorts of things that might interfere with that. Um, but assuming that I do, th there might come a point, and Proclus's view seems to be there will come a point, just before, you know, just as I'm about to get on the plane, where there's nothing else that could interfere with it, right? The, um, the weather systems are such that there isn't just about to be a storm, right? Um, um, there isn't a bomb just underneath it and so on. So all those things that might have interfered with it are no longer going to interfere with it at that point. And the thought seems to be then that as you get closer to events, um, options get closed off. And as you get really, really close to future events, there aren't any more options given the way that the world, the, the temporal causes operating in the world. Um, so for instance, it's now the case that it's necessary that none of us in this room could be in the UK in five minutes time, which is given the causes operative, none of us could be. Um, but yesterday, you could have been, it could have been the case that you were. Um, and so Proclus's thought seems to be that all that can be true. We can make those distinctions between what's um, necessary given the causes operative in time and what's not yet necessary. Even though whatever will happen um, has, has, is eternally determined by providence. So that, I take it that means that future contingents are true or false, right? Are determinately true or false. So although it might not yet be necessary um, and determined by the causes operative that I 
will get on a plane to London tomorrow. Um, it is now either true or false that I will. And um, the truth or falsity is a, eternally determined by the divine. So there's these two levels of causation um, operative. And the thought is that we can make sense of um, a kind of contingency when we ask what is determined given the causes operative in time, even against the backdrop of there being a sort of course of world history that is atemporally determined. Um, so Proclus says in On Providence, so it's not true that if the gods know the future, its outcome is by necessity fixed in the sense that would make it not contingent, but one should attribute to the future an undetermined outcome from what is determined and to the gods a determinate knowledge of what is undetermined. I take it because he's talking here about the way in which the gods cause the, um, the, um, these contingent things, that the undetermined outcome from what is determined, what is determined there does not mean um, what is determined now in time. What is determined there, I take it, is the divine being. So the thought is these things are undetermined in the sense that um, they're not determined by temporal things, but they are outcomes of the um, divine causality, and that's a kind of determinate atemporal causality. Okay, so there's quite a lot in that. Um, what I want to do is to step back and see whether we can make sense of it as an account of agency. And because I'm here, I um, <laughs> raised um, this problem first by quoting from Opsomer and Steele on, on this. Um, they raise a puzzle in their introduction to 10 problems on providence um, about how this can really make sense as an account of agency. And in particular, how you can reconcile this idea that everything is in some sense determined by providence with any kind of contingency that's, as it were, worth having, that's worth, um, um, that, that's, that would give you the kind of um, control of your actions that Proclus himself thinks is necessary for responsibility. So they say, even if God can know the future in an atemporal way, one cannot understand how this knowledge can be determinate unless God knows the future outcome as following by necessity. The price to safeguard God's determinate knowledge of future contingent events is to understand them ultimately as following from a series of antecedent causes known by God. I, have to say, I, I think that God doesn't know them as following from antecedent temporal causes in the temporal order, because I think um, Proclus holds that those antecedent causes are not sufficient to determine the, the um, later events. But at any rate, the gods, as I've argued, do know them as caused by they, the gods themselves, atemporally. And then they say, Obstman and Steele say, given such an overall divine knowledge in virtue of causative power, one wonders what is left of the contingent character of events, and in particular free human choices. Contingency thus appears to be incompatible with divine foreknowledge, despite all the claims to the contrary. This poses a serious problem for someone who, like Proclus, is committed to the premise that free will requires contingency. So what I want to do is to try and give a partial defense of Proclus from that um, worry. I take it there are two aspects of Proclus's position that seem particularly problematic. Uh, the first is the claim that future contingents are not just true or false, but also are known and caused to be true or false by a divine being acting outside time. So the, the first is, uh, like, why, why is it so important that, that we should have contingency and that um, not everything should have been determined completely by causes operative in time? If you still say, but everything is in a way determined by these atemporal causes. 
The second worry is raised by the passage that I quoted from 10 Problems. This is, um, it's all very well to say that there's contingency and to say that that means that our actions and choices have not all along been necessitated by prior things in time. So anything that you do, there was an earlier time work, but it was contingent that you would do that thing. Um, but if you then add that whatever you do becomes necessitated by prior things a short time before you do it, it se might seem you've kind of under taken away all the benefits, whatever it was, of insisting on contingency in the first place. So um, Proclus seems to think that it's important if you're to make sense of human agency to say that um, actions are contingent in his sense, that is, that it's not the case that causes operative from the beginning of time, so it's because that it's always been, the world has always been such that you would have ended up doing that thing, right? So there was a time at some point in the past when the causes then operative did not fix that you would end up acting in that way. So he thinks that's important to insist on, but why does he insist on, what, why is it worth insisting on that if when you get to, when you're about to act, um, what you do is necessitated? Um, so how could we reconcile, how could we make sense of this account? Here's a suggestion. There are, I think, two worries that someone might have about the compatibility of intentional agency with causal determination. So one kind of worry is that you might think, I only count as acting intentionally if at the time of my acting or possibly of my choosing, I could have acted or chosen otherwise. And then you might think, if everything's causally determined by prior causes, then at the time of my acting, I couldn't have chosen otherwise, and so I don't count as acting intentionally. So that's one kind of worry that you might have. Now, Proclus clearly does have some thought of that kind, because if you remember in the myth of Ur, it was important for him that, um, when you make a choice, you're making a choice between alternatives. So in a sense, there must be alternatives for you to choose from in the myth of her when you're choosing, choosing your life. And that suggests that at least in some sense, it is important that you could have chosen otherwise. There was, there was a range of options that you had to choose between. But that doesn't in any way mean that, think, that causes operative, including for instance, your character and things don't determine which of those you will in fact choose. Um, so it doesn't mean that given the causes operative at, in time, when you make your choice, those causes being what they are, you might have chosen one of the other options. It just means there have to be other options available. Um, and it seems to me that the remark in 10 problems about things becoming ne necessary shortly before they happen would be very hard to make if you had this worry. It's, it's, if you thought that it was really important that it was not, that at the moment when you made a choice, it was not determined which, how you, what you would choose. Um, because that doesn't seem compatible with the thought that um, it might be necessary shortly before, become necessary shortly before your choice that you will choose a certain way. So, it seems to me that if you approach this thinking that that's the central worry here, that we that in order to make sense of the kind of control we have over our actions, we've got to allow that at the time of choosing, um, the causes operative in the world do not determine which way you will choose. Um, then Proclus's account, I think, would be very hard to make sense of on that view. But, as I said on the handout, I think there's an alternative way that you might raise a worry about the compatibility of intentional agency and causal determination. So the alternative is not to focus on this idea that at the moment of choice you might have chosen otherwise. 
but instead to say, I only count as acting intentionally if I am the source, RK, of my actions or choices. So this is where I connect with the theme of your series of lectures. Um, so if you take the important thing to be, am I the RK, am I the source of my actions? Um, then I think you get a different picture. So, um, of course, one way, one thing you might think, you might combine these two different worries, and you might say, well, I only count as being the source of my actions if at the time of choosing it's not determined which way I would choose. But supposing Proclus doesn't think that, might he still think that it's important if I'm to be the source of my actions and choices, that it hasn't all along been necess necessary um, that I would choose that way? Um, well, I think he might. So here's a proposal. Suppose you have this account that I've attributed to Proclus on which um, the past is necessary, what's present is necessary, and future things, some of them are not yes, yet necessitated, but they do become necessary shortly before they happen. Well, then you might think that for me to count as a genuine source of my actions or choices, um, what matters really is what it is that explains how my actions or possibly the results of my actions go from being contingent given the causes operative in time to being necessary given the causes operative in time. So what's important is, you might think, is that I have a crucial causal role to play in things, in these things going from being contingent things that might or might not happen to being things that definitely will happen. So supposing Proclus thinks that, supposing he thinks that if a certain instance of fying is my action, then when this fying goes from being something that's a contingent, it's contingent that it will happen in the future to being something that definitely will happen, I have a crucial causal role to play in bringing that about. So it's because of something about me, about my character, that it's um, now necessary that I will finish this lecture within a few minutes, right? Um, um, that's, that's something to, that, that the reason that my giving this lecture is my action is that what's making it go from being a contingent thing that various things might have interfered with, which it was an hour ago, right? to being something that's necessary is something to do with me. Now, supposing instead you thought that it had all along been necessary that I would be standing here speaking these words to you, that is, causes operative 100 years ago fixed that the world would develop in a certain way which would lead to me standing here saying these words. Well, then it would not be the case that I had played a role in that becoming necessary because it was already necessary before I was born. Um, so the thought might be what's important to it counting as my action is that I'm a crucial part of the explanation of it's going from being a contingent thing that might or might not happen given the course is operative to it's being something that definitely will happen. And if that's Proclus's view, then I think it, it is possible to reconcile it with the idea that these things become um, necessary shortly before they happen. And it's possible to do that and still to see, see why it matters to him that it wasn't always necessary all along. Of course, you might still wonder, but how does all that fit with it being necessary from the eternal divine perspective? Right? But I think, I think that it does fit because it's still the case that that sound, seems like a worry if when you explain the eternal divine perspective, you say, as it's very hard to avoid saying, but it's already, it was already true <laughs> that I would give these because it was, but that already is a temporal, it, it's very hard not to hear that in a temporal way. And, and I think also another thing that probably helps here, although it's difficult to understand, is 
to bear in mind that the way that Proclus and the Neoplatonists in general think of the eternal is as a kind of eternal present. So I think insofar as you're thinking about the interaction between the eternal and these temporal things, you should think of it as, as if the causality is happening always at the present. Um, it's hard for us to think of the eternal and how it might have a cause or effect. And because of that, I think it's very easy to think of it as already fixed. It's already fixed that this would happen because that's already fixed from the eternal point of view. And then it's very easy to think of that as meaning already as in in the past. And that would not work right? with Proclus as a plan. But if the way that you think of it is as always happening in the present, then I think it's not such a, a difficulty to think that there is this, this it, is in, it is true and it's fixed as it's true, but there's this other question, which is, do causes operative in time um, necessitate it? And um, it could matter to human agency that the, hum that the human being plays a role in, in making it the case that the causes operative in time do necessitate this thing, even if um, what will happen is, from the eternal point of view, already fixed. So that's my attempt to solve that problem um, and give that to you.